idea for all this really came from a dream? Yes, it did. Good evening and welcome to Nox Mente. Tonight's guest is Mario Acevedo. Mario is the author of the national best-selling Felix Gomez Detective Vampire series. Most recently, steampunk banditos, sex slaves of Shark Island, and the YA humor thriller University of Doom. His debut novel, The Nymphos of Rocky Flats, was chosen by Barnes & Noble as one of the best paranormal fantasy novels of the decade. Speculative fiction was, has appeared in numerous anthologies to include A Fistful of Dinosaurs, Straight Out of Deadwood, Blood Business, Nightmares Unhinged, Cyberworld, and You Don't Have a Clue. For 2020, he has a short fiction in the forthcoming horror anthology Psy Wars, and it came from the multiplex, and a western novel Luther, Wyoming. His work has won International Latino Book Award and Colorado Book Award. Prior to becoming a professional writer, Mario was an airborne ranger, an infantry and aviation officer, an attack hel helicopter pilot, and a soldier artist in Operation Desert Storm. In civilian life, he has worked as an engineer and taught art in prison. He's also served as a president for Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers and the Rocky Mountain Chapter of the Mystery Writers of America. Currently, he serves on the faculty of the Regis University Mile High MFA Program and Lighthouse Writers Workshop. Mario lives and writes in Denver, Colorado. Mario, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, pleasure to have you. Were you, were you, uh, did you teach art in prison as a prisoner or a visitor? As as a visitor, okay. Yes, I, was, I, was, I was in and out. <laughs> That's very nice of you, and it says a lot about your character, Mario. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. So this is a extra special special show because Jerry has talked so highly of your books and uh, carried on, and this is not usual Jerry behavior, mind you. <laughs> like a little girl. <laughs> it's true Yay! and then uh, you know i'm just so in love with the art and all the titles alone and so i will be i will be binging you mario thank you thank you Binge away yes that that will happen and i read a lot so that that's going to happen i wanted to do that before the show it just it with everything going on our whole everyone's lives have gone to the side yes i understand Got it. Tell same, me here. same here i bet i bet how are you doing out there in colorado with all this oh uh, we're I, i'm doing okay i'm uh, a freelance uh, writer and and so my my clients are still with me um so that Knock on wood, you know, I, I'm almost, I'm actually almost hesitant to even talk about it for fear of upsetting Yeah, hard. yes. Uh, you. But, uh, you know, I'm saying I work from home. Um, it hasn't, like, like a lot of other, unlike a lot of other people, hasn't affected me as much as others. Um, so, but, you know, it's still this, it's strange walking around the neighborhood in the middle of the day and, and there's people, there's lots of people walking around, but everybody keeps their social distance. And it, yeah, and you you'll be walking to each other on the sidewalk, and and then when you get about fifty feet, one of you will go to the other side of the street, <laughs> and you know in any other circumstances it would be so rude, right? Yes. But here it's sort of like, oh, I'm doing you a favor by not entering your your COVID. Yeah, it it's 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 bizarre. What about your grocery stores? Are you able to get toilet paper? Oh, we have everything. We're, Good. You know, this is weird because I was, I was, I was, I was following this other YouTube channel, and this guy was talking two months ago about growing up, and he's like, "You better stock up on the basics and things." And as the days progressed, I thought, "Well, I guess well, better safe than sorry." So I went and I bought a bunch of stuff, thinking, "Oh, this will last the most three or four days." <laughs> <laughs> and here we are. I think we're going into our third week of. Uh, of the stay at home or shelter in place or whatever they call Oh, in Colorado. Yeah, we've Colorado. been, we the, in Washington, we've been in lockdown for a while. It's the unconstitutional yeah, yeah, actions. Were, I, think, I think you guys were the first. Yeah. Yeah, everything's changed here. There's, I mean, even the gas station, they have plexiglass everywhere, tape. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah we it's got that too. crazy. Okay. And like Home Depot, 10 people at a time in the, that whole building, but everyone's in line, like normal distance from everyone outside all the way around the corner. So, I mean, like, that makes no sense to me. Well, at our Home Depot, they do have, they put the tape on the ground, but you have people stretching. They, they, you enter through the garden center. Yes, same here. And, and, but they stretch <laughs> all the way through the parking lot or down the street. Um, yeah. I was, I was going to get something at the Home Depot and I saw that, that line. I'm like, well, I think. Yeah, I passed too, but Lowe's you can go into. <laughs> okay, well, that's good to know. That's good to know. Thank you. At least for now. Yeah. That's so, exactly where I shopped. I said, Jerry, fuck, you too. fuck the Home Depot. I'm going to Lowe's. <laughs> I don't want to do business with people behind plexiglass. It's stupid and it's retarded and it doesn't work because air flows around plexiglass. Yeah. 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 It's wow. at like the gas stations here though. It's everywhere. Yeah. Right. The liquor stores. <laughs> they don't, they don't have any plexiglass. Up. <laughs> oh, ours, ours have that little plexiglass stand that they put. In, well, one of them, one of the liquor stores, Molly's does that. The other place, Mondo Vino, they just wear the mask. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. We are definitely in new times. That's yes, for sure. Yes. Someone in just chat in chat just mentioned your cats in quarantine series. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> got a, <laughs> there got we a go. fan. There you go. Yes. There you go. Cats in quarantine, yeah. So let's let's jump on in. Tell us, Mario, about the world as far back as you can recall, the earliest memories you have about about the world as it was for you, the things that stick out. Okay, um, that one actually is easy uh, for me. Uh, my earliest uh, memories are from, we, we lived in uh, uh, Rapid City, South Dakota. That was in, uh, in the army and it was assigned to Ellsworth Air Force Base. And the, the images I see, one of them is my dad wearing his khaki uniform and he's walking toward me in his, in his khaki uniform. Those days used to starch him. So it was really just sort of dazzling in the sunlight. I remember that. And then I remember that we lived in an on base housing. We lived in Quonset Hut. I remember those. I love Quonset Huts. I always just really dig the curve. Right. I, uh, we lived in one of those. And then, uh, and then you know, that, that Woody doll from Toy Story? Yes. <laughs> I had one of those. And I remember my mom buying one, and I saw it on the shelf. And it was on a, some store on the base because it had the curved wall. And then I remember the, uh, the Red Owl supermarket that used to have a Midwest. Midwest. I, oh, I wow. I, of, I'm not familiar. I'm from the Midwest. So I'm not familiar with Red Owl. The Red Owl. Yeah. It was a supermarket chain. Um, I think it went under like 25 years ago. And That's I weird. remember the marquee. And the reason I, I remember what it was called is because my mom had the spice, um, you know, the little spice tins. Yes. Um, yes. Well, she had those with the Red Owl for years and then when i could read i could see that and i remember the logo it's like a little cartoon out from those uh, from those stores and then um after that i remember we were driving i remember the shadow of the car as we were going on the highway <laughs> and i remember looking out the window and i and i told this to my mom years and years ago but you know what you were doing you had opened the window, and I was getting my sister's uh, uh, bottle, eating bottle, and I was holding them by the nipple, and I was sticking them out the window, and I could see how far I could slide them out the window until the wind would take it from my hand. <laughs> and then I would grab another one. <laughs> and then we, we got somewhere, and my mom wanted to feed my uh, I was bottle, feeding my sister, and my mom's looking at the container, and she's like, what happened to all the bottles? And I said, I need to go out the window. <laughs> So, uh, so then the other uh, memory uh, from oh way my back god, then I bet <laughs> is uh, we stayed in this motel that had uh, that it's kind of cheesy today, but at the time I, I remember I really liked it. It was that kind of that Western motif style, and then the 
the sofa in the motel was like a cowhide. Mm -hmm. and, then the, and then the armrests were like wagon wheels. Mm -hmm. And then the um, lamps had stagecoach things. And I, it, for a long time, I didn't understand where that was. And then, um, well, a couple of months ago, I was going through my, my dad's papers and this discharge paper from the army. And it turns out I found the name of that motel that we stayed in. Because my dad was uh, being discharged from the army and we had to go to Fort Carson, Colorado. And that's where we were. We were at Colorado Springs. And that motel is gone. I, I looked for it online, raised decades. But there it was. This, this one memory suddenly came to life. There it was, one place. And those are the, like the earlier ones. And after that, you know, then I start, everything starts to kind of come together. You know? Yeah. I love, I love those memories though. And yes. it, interesting, I'm going to be looking up old red owl tens. I have I've an owl fetish. I always have uh, just to see the image and maybe find some, they sound cool. No, they're, they're all, they're all gone now. Um, you might but be you know what I'm like, saying on the vintage market? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. We had in Des Moines, we had like hinky dinkies. I don't know if you know no, what that no. is. Those are local. We had, uh, maybe Jerry knows Piggly Wiggly. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely in no Georgia. Piggly Wiggly, yeah. Yeah. H HEBs. <laughs> yeah. Up in Chicago, we had uh, White Hen. Yes, White Hen Pantry. Yeah. Yeah. 7-Eleven. <laughs> Yes, yeah, Seven Eleven for sure. <laughs> it's funny these regional things. So way back early, and so you're an Air Force baby. Well, actually, Army. That was using the Army uh, air defense. They were protecting the Air Force base. Okay, so I wrote that down wrong. Okay. And, <laughs> yeah, Jerry. No, I'm, I was thinking about something that I'm not going to ask. So never mind. And so, so back then and in this period, did you, were there things that you like that were say like cartoons? Did you play outside in nature at all? Oh, sure. Yeah. What I, um, yeah, you grew up in New Mexico, so I spent a lot of time in the desert chasing lizards. Um, and uh, we had a lot of roadrunners. Remember the quail? There's no point in chasing those. We never catch them. Yeah. You know, cartoons, you know, the usual. And Sunday, I mean, Saturday mornings, get up, we start watching at 7. And then about 10 o'clock, then my mom would kick us out of the house, make us go play outside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you have favorite? Cartoons? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, of course, the Looney Tunes. Love those. Mm -hmm. um, the... I, I noticed some of your other guests that like the, everybody kind of keys on the Looney Tunes and they and, and they always mention that you you couldn't broadcast those cartoons today. I know. <laughs> and and sadly, sometimes when you find them on YouTube, they're they're edited. I know, isn't that terrible? We yeah, should have them. Yeah, uh, yeah. The other guy I used to like was if you remember Droopy Dog. Yes, <laughs> Droopy Dog. Yeah, yeah. and uh, let me think. Johnny Quest, love Johnny. Quest. Oh my God, I love Johnny. Johnny Quest, Quest was awesome. Yeah, oh, the best. I, that that theme song, to Johnny Quest, was um, I, I can't remember the guy's name. He, he was a big time jazz musician that got hired to do the theme. And one time in the army, we were marching, you know, ceremonies, and, and they played the theme for Johnny Quest. <laughs> so, uh, Hoyt, <laughs> That's Hoyt, awesome. Hoyt Curtin. Okay, so. Yeah, it was it was very interesting because usually they're playing like John Philip Sousa and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then they decided to play the theme for Johnny Quest. Like, hi, oh, yeah, this is pretty bad. That's, that's Johnny Quest was super cool. Speed right. Racer and all that. Yeah. yeah. Speed Racer was like anime that they, they yeah dubbed. It was from that day. Yeah, it was Japanese. It was kind of a different style of uh, uh, that and Astro Boy. If you remember that? Yeah, oh, Astro Boy. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah yes. Totally. Oh my God, I love this. What, where in New Mexico, you know, New Mexico is my next favorite state in the United States. New Mexico and Washington have my heart. Really? Yeah. I, I, well, I'll just say New Mexico is my favorite place to be from. <laughs> um, having grown up there, I have a different. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. But yeah. I mean, it's its whole, it, New Mexico has a whole culture onto itself. 
mañana. That's good call. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> where, where in New Mexico did you grow up or did you move around? Uh, no, on the south, Las Cruces. Okay, yeah. Yep. I always liked, I lived in the Ortiz Mountains up over above Cerrios, mostly. Oh, yeah. have, have you yeah. seen the, um, the cartoon, the fake cartoon? It's a cartoon, but it's a fake cartoon. The C Lab 2021? No. It's, it has the father from Johnny Quest as like the main character. It's, oh, <laughs> I'll uh, send you a link to it. It's, it's a comedy. Eric Estrada is. Race Bant Banyan, Race Batten. It's the same draw, the same character drawing. Right. Oh, okay. But they're like in a sea lab under the sea. Eric Estrada is one of the scientists. It's it's a comedy. It's on Comedy Central. Never mind. <laughs> well, just kind of on, on an aside, in in a lot of the uh, conventions, you know what fan fiction is? Yeah. Yes. There's yeah. a lot of fan fiction, and they and they kind of just delve into the the relationships with the different characters uh, yeah. in, in Johnny Quest. M one of, particularly that there's some kind of a sexual tryst. relationship between the doctor and Race Bannon. And, uh, but actually, I was looking into that. Race Bannon had his heart broken. There's, there's an episode. <laughs> oh. There was a femme fatale. <laughs> there she, always is. <laughs> and, she, and, there was this and it was totally weird because it was about Race Bannon. It wasn't about Johnny Quest. And this fame fatale totally messed him up. <laughs> that's funny. Of I'm course, gonna, that's I'm what they find do. That. I gotta find I know, that it one. Was kinda, I remember I, I, when I was a kid, I never saw it, and I was, it was about a year ago. I was just going through the YouTube, and and uh, I found that one. I'm like, wow, this is interesting. It's crazy. You can't be a good femme fatale without messing 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 people. Up. Speaking <laughs> of fan fiction, uh, there. The Star Trek fan fiction is really huge. And oh, yeah, yeah. one of my best friends wrote and produced a movie based on a fan fiction piece called Axonar, I think it was called. And they got sued by Paramount and whoever else owns Star Trek, CBS, I think. Mm, man. But they. Yeah, Star Trek. Yeah. That, yeah, Paramount, whoever owns them, they, they jealously guard all their content so that even if you cite fair use and you know and include a little video clip you know in a peak or something uh, they'll slam you down well they actually made a movie based on this fan fiction which was in the star trek universe it didn't have any characters in it right right well, yeah very protective anyway that's on youtube it's a pretty good show I shut up. To check that out. Yeah. It, we'll put a link to it, Jer, of course. I'm working on it. it. So, Mario, what about when you were young? Did you have uh, any typical childhood fears? Darkness, the bed, the closet? Well, you know, growing up, Max, we had La Llorona. Which yes. Is, oh, yes. And, and then we had El Cucuy, which is the Mexican boogeyman. Yes. Uh, uh, La so, Llorona, scary. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I was all the way up until the ninth <laughs> grade, and, and uh, we had ditches that ran through uh, town, and, you know, I'd go and stay late at a friend's house. Like the and Arroyos? It, no, no, these were actual ditches. Irrigation ir ditches. Like irrigation, yeah, yeah. And, and okay. so uh, late at night, you just choose a route home that would avoid going next to the ditches. You know, we never questioned the fact that everybody had a, every community had a La Llorona. <laughs> you know, she gets around quite a bit. <laughs> she <right>? does. <laughs> so, oh. um, yeah, so that was, uh, that was big. And then El Cucuy was the boogeyman. The boogeyman. Yeah. But uh, growing up, we, I, I never had any, I never even heard of Chupacabras until I left New Mexico. And then the monsters in the closet and all that. Did you, were you raised, um, so I, were you raised religious at all? I'm going to think that because of the, of New Mexico, Catholic might come in. Okay, I was raised in a very religious household, but I'm, I'm one of the 98% of all Mexicans are Roman Catholic. I'm the 2% that is not. Oh my God, you're, a, you're, you're a rare jewel. 
Well, no, nah, I don't think. But uh, <laughs> I was uh, raised uh, in the Southern Baptist. Church. Oh. oh, wow. Yeah, the Spanish Baptist Church was the branch of the Southern Baptist. Church. Yes. And, and I would attend uh, for a while. I went to the Methodist, United Methodist Church or Pentecostals. Yes. Uh, yeah. We would, um, when we would go to Mexico, my aunts in Mexico belonged to the Pentecostal church. So it was kind of weird hearing speak, people speaking in tongues. <laughs> it was, you know, a Spanish accent or Mexican accent. I would, I actually would love that. I'm one of the things I am, I personally love Mexico and I have a lot of, um, when I lived in New Mexico, I was able to, of course, get all kinds of, I like Catholic, I like stuff around Catholicism. So all the retablos and all the, all that stuff permeates my house. I have so much of it. And uh, and when I moved away, that's one of the sad things. But I am wondering with your upbringing and being not having that influence, were were the religious icons in the house at all? The Holy Bible. That was it, because that's what they do. The Methodists strip all that other stuff. Yeah, the Baptists. You know, growing up, like I, I like the other, the other kids. I remember on Thursday, right after school, they'd go to catechism, mm -hmm. and I had no idea what catechism was. And then I tell them that I would go to Sunday school. I had. No idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, well, if I had to pick, I would be Catholic. Right? Yeah, they they have much better wedding. Yes. Oh my God! Everything's so juicy. The rituals, the candles, the incense. It right. just to me i love it well they had we had a lot of older uh cathedral uh, church mm -hmm. yeah uh, so and a lot of my friends pretty much all my group they all have pictures of the first holy so yeah i was very very immersed Kind of at a distance from the Catholic Church. I also had a lot of Mormon friends too. So. Yeah, I was surprised at how many Mormons there are in New Mexico. That was something that really surprised me. And this is the other is the the number one, the fastest growing church in Latin America is the Mormon. Oh my God, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not going to say, I mean, you know, that's great, but I hate to see the, uh, I, you know, one of the things that saddened me is the, the terrible stuff that's befallen, How, the, you know, the priests, the terrible things they've done and all that stuff's come out. It needs to come out, but I'm one of those people of the art and I don't like seeing the churches fall for the beauty, the art. You, you know, right, and the ritual, and how beautiful it's all presented, and so, especially for the really scrubbed down stuff, so that, that always makes me a little sad when I see, see stuff like that going on, but, you know, I love art, so, it, so back, also, so back here early, did you, what was your relationship, how were you dreaming, do you remember being a dreamer, was it part of your life, um, no, um, I guess my only dream I remember from my childhood was when I was, uh, we'd gone to Mexico, I was about 10 years old and I got really sick. Uh, you know, they say, don't drink the water. Well, that applies to Mexicans as well. And I got really sick and, uh, they had, a, uh, so I'd have nightmares and in, in these nightmares, it was, uh, I, these big giant like balloons would be chasing me and I'd be oh. running and I was afraid that these things would you know catch me and and that so many many years later remember that tv show the prisoner and uh, yes uh, with the white balloon Patrick Magoon would try to escape and they'd send those big giant beach balls after him that so much reminded me of those nightmares of when I was a kid uh, but those nightmares were really revolved around when you were sick. 
That's correct. Yeah, I know. And, and, you know, from listening to your other show, and I was trying to think about, because I know you'd ask me about dreams. And I think for me, most of my dreams, like all my dreams have been uh, involved around the my subconscious, you know, something is is in my percolating in my subconscious. And that's what my dream is, is working on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. There's that whole angle there. And it's, just, you know, it's significant, of course. I've but, had similar dreams to that. With the big balloon? Yeah, but it's always been around like alien abductions where it's, uh, well, not I can't say it's alien, but that it would pick me up like this balloon would pick me up and then I time travel somewhere. Oh, oh that's interesting, Jerry. I've never, you've never talked about that. Yeah, I have, I have told you about it. The big blue balloons. Man, I guess I'm drawing a blank. It was a while ago. Anyway. <laughs> That's, I find it interesting. Someone, so, someone in chat wanted to know if you ever went to summer camp. Did I go to summer camp? Yes. Um, yes, I went to uh, only twice. It's a cotton it was the Cotton Church summer camp. And it was when I was probably in the eighth or ninth grade. So it was just these hormones running rampant <laughs> it was just an excuse to spend time with uh it, it, it just so happened that the, that the methodist church there had the best looking girls so that's why i went <laughs> yeah. to summer camp with the methodist church instead of, instead of the baptist uh camp nothing happened you know it was just a big gossip fest and it would rain a lot <laughs> and, uh, uh, but that was the only two summer camp times i went to summer camp I went to camp. I can't. I'm assuming, I'm sorry. assuming the army doesn't count, right? No, <laughs> no. somewhat. Somewhat. Well. I, I assume this person knew you or something. Oh. Uh, I went to camp in Estes Park. Oh, nice. It's funny in Chicago. No, in Colorado. Yeah. In Col oh, Estes Park. Yes. Um, yes. It was called Camp St. Malo. It was at the base of Mount, Mount Meeker. Right. I oh, that's interesting, that. Jer. One time or more? No, like months. four or five summers. We would go for two weeks at a time. Yeah, it was cheap as shit. It was like sixty-five bucks a week. Oh my god! It was. I found out later it was like a. a, a re, it was a religious camp too, so we had to do church every morning. It was horrible, but it was like for poor kids. But my parents sent us there because it was cheap. I did summer camp. It was a horse summer camp, and. I loved it. And of course, I, it was a co-summer camp, so there were boys and girls. And for me, yeah, it was every year like the, the crush, like well, I get to see that same boy again the next year. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was so great. And then all the horse riding and fossil finding and, and leather working. And of course, it was a horse camp, so it was, you know. But yeah, right. camp was fun. But it, what I was mirroring is what Mario was saying. It was just like, for me, it was a hormone thing too. That was like my favorite crush every year. Yeah, I, I know, I was so clueless too. I remember this one girl, I was with her, we were kind of together. And for some reason she kept stepping on, on my foot. And I was wondering why is she stepping on my foot? You know? And it's just that we were so awkward. We just didn't know how to like <laughs> do something else. <laughs> yes. Oh man, I love that stuff. The awkwardness. Yeah. That's good stuff. So what about in so in your early dreams? So the the big balloons and stuff, you were how old would you say when that that was happening. That was that was like ten years old. Okay, all right, good. And then, um, so let's move forward a little. So let's get to some of your dream architecture here. And so when you dream, and this is just at any period now, just and it can be now, you know. But when you dream, what does the dreamscape appear as for you? Color, taste, sensation. Can you read? Can you smell? All that stuff. Yeah, all of it. It's like, it's like reality. I mean, I mean, you know, I can, if, if I need to taste something or smell something in my dream, um, I mean, that happens. It's, it just, it, it doesn't seem any different, um, than, you know, than conscious. That's interesting, uh, you know, because it is a lot different for a lot of people and those things, uh, 
that's, I mean, it sounds like you might, do you have a good deal of lucidity in your dreams? Yes. Yes, I do. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm aware of what's going on. Yeah. And you're aware you're dreaming? Usually no. Usually no. It's not until, actually, I don't even know the dream until I, I, until I wake up the next morning. And then, and then my memory starts sort of stuttering through the dream and I, and, and I try to replay it as best I can. So I, so I won't forget it. And in, in, so in like through the totality of your life, have you had any moments where you were just fully lucid or even out of body, like astral projection? No, no. That you can remember? Because I, not, no, not, not, yeah, not, not, not that I can remember. No, I've never had a, a astral projection episode, anything like that, no. And have you had any near-death experiences? Uh, you, you know, I, I, I was listening to your show at Denver Michaels was talking and about it. And I said, and I was thinking, oh, I've never had one. And actually I have. Um, again, I, was, I, was, I think I was 10. We were on a family vacation in Phoenix, Arizona. My, I was swimming with my uh, sister. We jumped in the pool and I convinced my sister, I think she was eight, to jump in the deep end of the pool and I had the lifeguard ring and she couldn't swim. And I said, look, if, if you need, if you need the ring, I'll, I'll give it to you. And of course my sister didn't believe me. <laughs> and uh, so she jumped in the water and she started flailing about, and then I pushed the ring toward her and she climbed on the ring and then she climbed on top of me. And she was actually standing on my head and we were in the deep end of the pool and I was drowning. And I, I remember this moment of surrender. I said, I, I'm dead. And then I felt myself rising out of the water and I thought, I'm going to heaven. An angel has picked me up out of the water. You know, I'm going to heaven. And the next thing I know, I was dropped on the concrete and it was my dad who had rescued me. And then my mom came and she slapped me on the back and I caught the water and, and uh, then we, we both were herded back into the motel room and my dad spanked us. And then my sister was very unapologetic the whole time. First, <laughs> like, first to try. Your own fault, she said. If she would have just given me the ring when I wanted it, I wouldn't have tried to drown. <laughs> but that's the only time. I, I remember that moment very distinctly where I thought I, I was on my way to heaven. Did, it, did you feel pain when you took in the water? You know, I, no, I don't, I don't remember pain. I remember panic. I remember terror. Mm -hmm. but no I don't remember pain no. and when you were in that kind of you thought you were going up to heaven mm -hmm. you were actually able to see down were you, were you out of your body at that time no no I so it was just right. all happening in your head right there well no I was happening I mean, it wasn't in my head I was actually in the water drowning no, I mean the thought of it, the thought of... Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. The thought of me rising up to heaven was just me and... It, yeah, that was just in my head, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It's very interesting, actually. Did you, around that... So after that, did you have any fear of the water at all? No. So you the were just fine. my sister. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Yeah, no, yeah. no, I was not afraid of the water. I, I, I... I you know, I, I knew exactly what had happened and why, so no, it wasn't because of the water. And it, you have just a sister? Any other siblings? I'm the oldest of four. Okay. Uh, and then, and then uh, uh, I have uh, two sisters, and then my, my brother, 10 years younger than me, and one of my sisters just passed away. So, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, yeah. It's very sad. Did you, well, with your sister that passed away, did, have you dreamt of her? No. No. Yeah. Was it just recently? Uh, in 2004. She died of breast cancer. Oh, it's terrible. So sad. I'm sorry, Mario. Well. So, okay. So back here with these dreams, in the, 
in the dream realm, in the dream realm, and then looking at, so I read through some of the, um, the, you know, the, uh, oh, geez, I'm drawing a blank right now, the synapses of your books and all that. Did you get for your books any of that content? Where do you think some of the content came from for the theme of your books and of your art? Did any of it, was any of it informed through other experiences, other portals like dream? I mean, clearly imagination comes into play. Well, uh, in my books, dreams, no. Some of my short stories were inspired by, by dreams. And I think it was my subconscious sort of flailing around for an idea for a story and then it, it came up with one. Um, but through the, you know through those portals or anything like that no no i uh, if if you if you want me to tell you why i decided to write vampire stories yeah let's i i'm very interested in that because i i actually like vampire stories a lot okay. all right well um i uh well what happened is um i guess around 19 is far back around you know i was a real bookworm uh, growing up. In fact, in the summertime, my mom would call the library and tell them, hey, send Mario home, right? Um, so I just I loved books and reading, and I never really thought about being a, a, a writer, an author, for sure. And then um, about, I think it was around 1988, I was at the library, and I was just reading through books, and I read one particular book that is like the most dangerous idea any wannabe writer would ever have, which is, I can do better than this. If this guy got published, I can get published. So I, I decided right there, I said, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna get a, you know, I'm gonna get a novel published. And so I went to Radio Shack and I bought a computer, a Trash 80. Yes, I had one too. Yeah, Trash 80. I mean, this is so far back, <laughs> is that uh, I had seven and a quarter inch floppy disks. Oh, it was a Model 2? Yeah, I, I forget. I don't remember that. And, <laughs> and they had an A and a B drive. Mm -hmm. and computers today don't even have B drives anymore. There were 180K floppies. Oh, oh yeah. And then, and then when I went and bought the computer, they asked me because they did not have an, uh, a hard drive. And the hard drive that they had was a, a three meg hard drive for $300. <laughs> so, so you paid $100 per meg. And the reason I didn't buy it is because I thought I will never have anything that's going to occupy three megs of storage space, right? <laughs> oh my God. I know. So now a, an email today has got more than that. <laughs> yes. You know, the first hard drives that came out for some of the TI machines were five and 10 megabyte drives. Yeah. This one I remember was the size of, it was a, it was the size of a big dictionary. It's bigger than a yep. shoebox. Yep. Yep. And uh, so anyway, I started writing and, and, and then I had a, a dot matrix printer with the tractor drive, you know, the paper that is perforated on the side. Yeah, it's, Epson it's, MX80. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, so, I, so I started writing a, my, my first story and then I got about 100 pages into this story and it was sort of like a Mad Max post-apocalyptic story. And I ran out, I said, I, I don't know what the story is. I had this guy doing all kinds of stuff and people chasing him, but I had no idea why he was doing it or, or any, the, no story question. So I kind of thought about it. And, and so then I started writing another story and uh, it would take me about a year and a half or two years to, to write a novel. And then I'd start sending them out and I started getting uh, rejection letters. And, you know, but I think I was sort of slowly, you know, incrementally improving my craft. Unfortunately, I was doing this all on my own. I didn't belong to a writing group. I didn't even know they were writing groups. How old were you at this time? I was in my 30s. Okay. And um, so I, I ended up moving here to Colorado and I joined a writing, writing group. And we had a, a very good critique group and they, and they were really good at shepherding me along. And um, I won a couple of like local awards, you know, enough to make me think I knew what I was doing. And so I, I wrote one novel that I thought for sure was gonna get me published. Uh, it was this is man's action thriller kind of a story, right? 
and drug dealers in Mexico and femme fatales and treachery, you know, uh, double crosses, all this really cool stuff. High adventure action, helicopter crashes, you know, all these things. And, um, and I had uh, uh, like the model query letter. I had everything all figured out. I didn't get a response. I didn't, it's, it's like the publishing industry in New York said, we're not, we don't, we're not even going to encourage this guy by giving him a no. Right. It's just complete. I was just ignored. I mean, I, I no one, they didn't even send me a, a no thank you letter. Right. So all the core letters that I sent, I got absolutely no response from any of them. And I got so frustrated. I said, you know, the hell with it. I'm going to write the most ridiculous story I can think of. I'm going to write about a vampire detective investigating an outbreak of nymphomania at a nuclear weapons plant. <laughs> Hell yes. <laughs> and that, that became the nymphos of Rocky Flats. And, that, and that's sort of how I got into it. Um, Was now, this before or after Desert Storm? <laughs> this is after Desert Storm. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, Desert Storm was 91. I wrote nymphos uh, starting like... Well, I actually worked at Rocky Flat. So when I was there, I was there 93, 94, 6. And I, oh, wow, I, 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 I stayed with that novel for, for quite a while. And then finally, I, 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 got, a, I got an agent interested in 2003 uh, with that. So that's, that's how that happened. But the thing is, is that um, I, I hope, Nish, you're not disappointed in me but yeah i actually did not like vampire novels or monsters i i just couldn't get into those stories but what happened was about that time i don't know if you know who charlene harris is she wrote this book dead until dark and that became the uh the true blood series oh yes and she her well anyway the first the, the first book that that series was drawn from was called dead until dark and that was the only only vampire book that I really got into and what and what I thought was that there was this canon of vampire rules that you had to adhere to right and this and and, and then I read her book and she just sort of said well this is what I'm going to do and had fun with it and she, and she actually had a lot of humor uh about the supernatural and I really liked that so I said okay I, you know I said okay I just make up my own rules I just make up my vampire the way I want them and and I decided to 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 play it or to approach the book as if vampires actually existed, and you know what would that actually mean? And I didn't like the idea of the vampire, like the goth vampire in the castle, and that to me just seemed like if nothing else, it's just an easy target. Uh, so and I always liked uh, mystery novels, and in fact, some people who read my books come and they tell me, Mario, we can tell you're actually a mystery writer because that's how my novels are structured. But my protagonist is a vampire detective. He's a private detective. And, and uh, I kind of have to get around the different rules about the vampire world. Uh, but you know, it's been a lot of fun. Vamp you know, my vampires have been very good to me, so I can't complain. What, what I got from reading the little snippets I did was definitely there's a noir feel. I haven't read any, and like I said, I'm gonna binge you. But there was, a Someone a just definite... typed. Somebody just typed noir in the chat. Oh, cool, cool. I love noir, and so uh, I think that's what attracted to me, and then attracted me to your stuff when I first was just digging through your canon of of stuff, and I thought these that comes off what i want to say here mario is that actually comes off and it seems interesting and different it was like when i read the gilda uh vampire i can't remember the writer for gilda but it was a whole different type of vampire and uh unlike it was a different vampire book like i'd never read before and i was just madly in love with that book as well and so i like people that push off and away from from the others from other stuff i think this is important and this is what we should do so and and that's what uh you know great teachers should do that this here's here are the classics now push away and you clearly have done that mario okay thank you so 
Yeah, that that noir aspect. Did you so in the process of writing though, in the process of bringing these characters to life, did you have they occupied any space in your I mean, clearly they occupy space in your unconscious, but have you seen them as anything been presented through when you're working these details out through dreaming at all? Or is it just like, how does the muse come for, for you to present a new storyline or a new thread or a new continuation? Um, well, the, <laughs> what happens is I, I sit at my desk and um, I start typing and then the muse shows up. Um, and I, I, I actually do give some classes and uh, about, uh, I have a, a presentation called uh, 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 Demons and Angels, uh, Why You Don't Write and Why You Do, where I do talk about uh, the, the muse and, and inspiration. And, but I always say that the, 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 muse shows, the muse loves to show up when you're already at work. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with writing writers that, particularly fiction writers, that we we tend to classify ourselves in two ways. Uh, one of them is a pantser, and the other one is a plotter. And the pantser is a seat of the pants writer. You just sit down, you start writing, and let your imagination goes. And the other one is a plotter, which actually you sit down and you write an outline first, and sort of and work out the plot details as you go uh, and then and then from there you start writing the you know whatever work that you that you've got i'm at first i was more of the the pantser kind of writer but now i'm more of the plotter where i outline it uh, and it gives me direction and it helps i think save time um, but one of the things though is as, as you're writing and i've learned is to kind of like keep a lot of doors open uh, because even when I will, have, for example, I'll say in this chapter, you know, my character Felix goes somewhere and he meets somebody. Well, and I say, well, and, and I do that as sort of like a plot point in the story. But then when they meet, then the other character gets, I have to flesh out the other character. And then I have to ask myself, what is that other character's agenda? And oftentimes the story will, will tend to go off in a different direction. And, and I just tell, and I tell people, you have to acknowledge when that happens. That's the muse telling you, talking to you. Um, and, or, or more directly, it's, it's your own subconscious processing saying, well, these are the way that people or characters are going to react to a situation like this. And you have to, uh, you know, have to acknowledge that and, and go with that. So, um, you know, so where do the ideas come from? Um, a lot of them, I, you know, I, I tell people this is the universe talking to you. And uh, sometimes when you get stuck, uh, I, you're, you're trying to push a story along and it's not working or it comes off as contrived. And then I tell people kind of stand back and, and uh, maybe give yourself a little bit of time and then, and then go forward again. Or uh, exercise, if we have characters meeting and talking, have the secondary character say the complete opposite of what you think they should say. And what it does is it introduces some conflict in the story that you didn't think was there. And then you can use that in, in developing the plot and the narrative. Mm, I like hearing all that. I have, I have a heavy writing background too. And uh, a lot of my, all the extra classes that weren't like painting and, and my college experiences were all writing based because I'm fascinated with storytelling Mm -hmm. and how stories live in us and how we move them forward. And, you know, this is what everything around us is stories, really, our memories, our dreams, our um, aspirations. It's all just a series of stories. And so to come are, forward. Are you familiar with the book Sapiens, A Brief History uh, of Mankind? I think I am. I, you it's, all, go ahead. I'm gonna have to, Jerry. Will you pull that, Jerry? I'm looking at it. Okay, I don't, see, I don't see you, so I can't <clears> tell. <throat> Who was uh, the author? Uh, Yuval Noah Harari. Yeah. I feel like I <sighs> might actually have that. Well, in in that book, he 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 talks about. It's more of an anthropological history of of uh, humanity. And he makes a, a, a very good 
point that we what what sets us hom uh, Homo sapiens uh, apart from all the other uh, animals is this ability to tell stories, and more importantly, the ability to to gossip. Because in gossiping, we're able to build relationships you know, several um, several times removed from the original person. You know, from from the original person. So you know, you're talking about six degrees of separation. Uh, well, gossip allows us to build relationships with people we've never met, and uh, this this is what really kind of sets us apart. Uh, some gave us an advantage over the other uh, proto humans. Uh, you know, so it's a really a fascinating way of looking at that. And then you also think about that. You you, you mentioned stories. It, everything is uh, that's how we process or share information uh, is through stories. I mean, hopefully, people listening to this, uh, you know, think of it's a think of it as some sort of an extended story. You know, the the things that we watch on Netflix and stuff. You know, what we want, we want stories. Absolutely. Well, and this is this is and part of the magic with stories. And of course, anyone that writes knows this about getting getting that suspension of disbelief, you know, when you really can get someone to step outside and engage in a story you're telling. But this is it's also, as we see in like modern times, how weaponized it can be with propaganda and because it's all stories. And 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 so getting people involved with stories is a very powerful tool for good and for bad. And uh, and I personally find that the more I find that there's more truths under the fiction title than there is under other titles. And because you're allowed the freedom of expression within within fiction and and create like under creative writing as well uh plus on some level you're channeling the collective yes or, or mining the collective for ideas yes well yeah, yeah i think i yeah it's definitely with fiction um like i tell people i, I write fiction so that by de facto makes me a professional liar <laughs> uh, <laughs> or or a mage you know mage. seriously <laughs> there was I, I don't know remember there was the when i was growing up there was this book called the eiger sanction yeah that was a really uh and they made clean would make it made a really lousy movie out of it but the book oh. was pretty good and i actually loved it when it came out i think it came out in 1975 and i bought um Recently, I bought a used copy, a hardback, and it's got a pink cover. It's really kind of garish, uh, considering. And there's a guy with a gun, you know, it's about an assassin. But there's a line in the <laughs> book where one of the one of the characters tells the other one, "You'll never get far in life believing a liar like me," so, <laughs> or like my unofficial motto. But um, no, you. That's I was I was um, yeah I was actually thinking about that uh, that that the power of what fiction can do, and one of the things that it can do is it can it can kind of strip away a lot of the, I guess, a lot of the, the thicket from the whatever you're trying to write about, and and then to put it in a in a context that makes it easier to understand. And I have a really good example of that. Uh, there's this uh, uh, another Chicano writer named uh, Michael Naba, who uh, he mainly writes fiction, uh, uh, mystery novels, but he wrote this book called City of Palaces, which is about the uh, uh, Mexico City at the end of the 19th century and just before mm -hmm. the start of the Mexican uh, Civil War. We call it the Mexican Revolution, but it's the Civil War. And honestly, I have tried several times to understand what happened. And it, it's very confusing time because the all the politics in the Mexican Revolution, it makes Game of Thrones look like a pillow fight. I mean, it is just backstabbing, treachery, and that. But it's all these names and and dates, and I could never really understand that. And then I, uh, Michael Nava, in his uh, book, you know, it's a fiction, uh, you know, it's a novel. But then he explained it, and he put everything in a context, and then I could understand what was really going on and why it happened as as it did. Um, so that was, to me, that was a really good example of somebody able to explain a very confusing and difficult subject and 
and kind of simmer it down to its basics and to make it very relevant uh, to the reader. That's part of the power of storytelling is to sort these details out and make them chewable, especially when they're complex and uh, interwoven so tightly by things, especially when we're talking fiction, uh, is interwoven by politics or who won what and all that stuff that is interesting. I remember when I first read, oh, geez, House of the Spirits, is that it? From Isabel Leande, uh, which the, they made such a terrible movie of this amazing book. And, uh, you know, it brought that whole, the Pinochet area, Pinochet yeah. area into context for me in a different way. Of course, you know, I was in love with their characters, Claire the Clairvoyant. <laughs> that was my favorite. Uh but it brought in a whole different perspective of what was going on during this time. And uh, it can, it can root you into, uh, into real life around deep political stuff. And this is a great power. This is, this is why I love fiction in particular, because you have the freedom to to walk into some difficult territory and present, and this is where I came from earlier, and present actually some some truth, and uh, that pe- and 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 can construct uh, on the ground real palpable ideas for what may be going on, what could be going on, and the possibilities are just endless endless under that header of fiction right it's magic it's pure magic so when you started to so when you're let's back up here when you were little and you were thinking about you would have ideas about you as an adult did you at any point think writing was going to be i mean you dreamed so you may not have physically gone to bed and dreamed you were going to be a writer, but in some way you, you, you dreamed it. If you know what I'm saying, metaphorically, you created this story for your life that is now your life. And so you wanted it and you must have believed in it enough because you manifested it. Did it, I'm just wondering where did this germinate for you? Being a writer? Yeah. Uh, hmm. Where it could really work, where it could really be, you know, because here you are. And I think anyone that comes through with a bunch of books, and, and this is successful to me, you you are a successful writer. And so, uh, so it's not like you just have all these books on a hard drive somewhere. You've, you've presented to the world these books you have been published and so it's a dream of success in the end and so i'm trying to garner this and give people out there uh, an avenue into how we manifest okay well um i, I guess i'll uh, my writing i'll have i guess i'll start at the beginning and, and uh for me uh, well, when I was in the sixth grade, I, I remember my our English teacher, Mrs. Anderson, she paired us up and we had to write a book to students. And I was paired up with this guy named Stuart Williams. And we had six weeks to write a book and Star Trek had just come out. This would be like 1968. So it was the original Star Trek. And he and I were just crazy about that show because that was... That was the science fiction show we had been waiting for, right, as kids. It all that cool stuff and had a spaceship that looked so different. And then they had the matter transformer, a matter, matter, yeah, the, the, the trans, what is that called? The matter transporter, transformer. the transporter. Matter transporter, the matter transporter and the phasers and <laughs> yep. the shields. Yep. And the colors. Oh yeah, my God. all that. Yes. All that was cool. <laughs> and uh, Spock, right? Yep. Of course. And, and so we, so we were crazy about that. So he and I, we just started, we would say, we're going to write this book and it, it got away from us. So six weeks later, we had to turn in our books and they were really booklets and a little, 
uh, illustrated booklets. And some of the stories that the other students had were pretty clever. Like one of them, Santa Claus had his, somebody stole his sleigh. So he had to deliver presents on his skis. And that was a big ordeal for him. And then, and then somebody else wrote this other book about the dog wasn't lost. The owners were lost. The dog was trying to find the owners. So, so, so it was a very, I mean, I mean some of them had some oh, really good. cool ideas. So, but Stuart and I, we didn't have anything. And, and Mrs. Anderson called us up because we were good students. And, you know, we were always busy in, in, during, you know, the assigned time. So we pulled out this uh, three ring binder full of notes and drawings and you know the names of the crew and star maps and uh our uh our ship was clearly a ripoff of the enterprise um but uh and then the uniforms as well it, you know so we actually had had we're putting together and we had an outline for uh an epic what would call today an epic space opera uh, uh you know so we obviously you know, didn't come anywhere close to writing the book, but Mrs. Anderson was so impressed because we actually did more work than anybody else. So she gave us an A. And what happened is for me that that particular story kind of stayed with me and I would daydream that story all the time. I'd be riding my bike or I'd be, my mom would send me to the store and I'd go to the store and I'd pretend the store was a, a, a secret cache of supplies and I'd somehow try to work it into the this narrative, and uh, this thing just kept growing and growing and changing. Because then, when I was in uh, uh, junior high school, I started reading the John Carter series, the Edgar Rice Burroughs. Yep. Yep. Oh yeah. And and that of course influenced me, took me in a, in that different direction. So I started uh, expanding my 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 universe, as it were. Uh, Is that where Bob Dunker came in? Bob Dunker. Spaceman. <laughs> Someone in chat who knows you said you wrote a cartoon series in junior high. Oh, wow. Some people are really coming after me, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not in there, but I love that. They're, they're, not, <laughs> they're not haters. I mean, this, this guy was a friend of yours in school. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, and so uh, Bob Dunker, yeah. Uh, and, and then also remember the other series, uh, Doc Savage. Mm-hmm. I, I, that was a big yes. influence on me too. Doc yes. Savage, I, that, that character. Um, but I changed him. I had like a Doc Savage who was like the flame from the Fantastic Four, except my guy, instead of being on fire, he had electric, he was electric and he could shoot bolts out of his feet and that's how he'd fly through the air and, and that. Um, so, uh, so all that was going, so my best friend and I, we would get together and we'd have these, these, uh, he had his own stories and, and I had these notebooks full of drawings and, and maps. And so then one time though, in, in uh, uh, I think when I was in high school, uh, this, we had a new, it was, I was in the Methodist, I was going to the Methodist church and the preacher changed and the new preacher came in and he had a, he had a son that was about my age. I invited him to the house, my house, and I showed him all this stuff. So he went back and he told everybody else in Sunday school that I was crazy. And I lived in this fantasy <laughs> world, and and it really, it really, it it it, it really uh, uh, it hurt me, right? Yeah. And and of course, you know, this is Las Cruces, so they had no imagination, and and they kind of made fun of me, and they gossiped about me, you know. And, and they didn't use the word nerd back then, but you know, they had some other word like that. And so after that, I kept I kept quiet on that uh, uh, for the longest time, and then. Um, and then when I was in college, and I never really actually seriously wrote anything. Um, so then when I was in college, I was an engineering student and I got a, D, and I hated English and I got a D in sophomore English. And they told me you can't graduate with this D. Oh, wow. You got to take another English class. So I was like, oh my gosh, this is, oh, I didn't want to hear that. So they said, well, because you're an engineering student, you can either take business writing or technical report writing. So I said, well, okay, I'll take a technical report writing class. And my instructor was named Patrick Kelly, I remember. And the first day of class, he brought in all these little brochures and pamphlets. And we he distributed them and we were reading them. And he was deconstructing them and telling us why they were bad writing. And he said, just because something is in print doesn't mean it's, it's any good. Um, and then he said that the whole reason to write anything is to get your idea 
across as clearly and hopefully as concise as possible. And when he said that, it was like this big light went off in my head because I had never heard that. Or if some teacher said that, I'd never, I'd never registered. I thought the whole reason to write anything is so you could sound you know, smart, like an English you know, country squire or whatever. So after that, I mean, I really, I liked that class. I got an A in it. And then uh, after, after college, I went into the army and, and I would look for every opportunity I had to, to write something, right? And um, I had some articles published in army journals. Um, and uh, when I was in the advanced course, we had to write papers. And I really liked that. And, and uh, the instructors would uh, send back and go, wow, this is really good. And I'm like, well, thank you. And you know, I'm trying, I really like this. And you know, like that, I'm very ac kind of academically minded. And I thought I'd be writing, you know, sort of essays and that kind of stuff, man of letters as it were. But then when I got out of the army, I, I kind of got pulled out of that. And then I ended up going into fiction. So um, uh, so I guess that's that's what kind of pulled me was just this idea that I could write. And then that I had um, some, some stories. I will have to say that what took me, I didn't get published until I was 50 years old. And that's when my first book came out. And the reason what took me so long was, well, one was I had to learn what to do, how to write. And the other one is that I actually had to give myself permission to write. Because I would tell myself, who am I to think that I could write something worth reading, right? And it's something worth your time to, to take my story in. You know, and I actually had to had to give myself permission at one time to say, uh, you know, I, uh, I kind of had to rationalize to myself, yes, I can write and I have a story to share and my stories are just as valid as everybody anybody else's story. And when I when I uh, teach, I, I tell people that as well. I share that with people. I said, you know, you don't need anybody's permission to to write. You don't need anybody's permission to share your stories. And, and your perspective is just as valid as everybody is anybody else's. That's such a major, major lesson. And this, it just gives me the chills. When you said you got published at 50, it gave me the chills in the best of ways, Mario, because it is, it goes against the grain of what, is so programmed into people's heads. Here you are, you're clearly a lifelong writer, you know, the way your your head, the way you work with active imagination and daydreaming uh, these great stories and these narratives around you. And that th that this is this is when you got published. It just it's remarkable important and, and I love I love it. it it's it feels like it feels like a reward in a way for for just being true if that makes sense well i mean i think uh persistence is is very important um well the just the, of, the power yes. of attention you know following yes. through that's that's very important um i <laughs> i i some of the other writers you know we talk about our, you know, our writing habits and that, and, and a big subject is your writing space. And uh, some writers talk about the writing space is a very sacred place and some, they have a ritual and they have, some of them even have candles and, and, and maybe little kind of fetishes and stuff. And I tell people, <laughs> my writing space is the sausage factory. You know, I just, <laughs> I sit down and it's, it's time to go to work, buddy. Turn on the machine and start at it. But, uh, you know, I say, you know, but, but the, the, the muse likes to find you at, hard at work and, um, uh, and that uh, opportunity shows up wearing work clothes. And that's, mm -hmm. that's sort of my mantra. Mm -hmm. In some ways, writing is a, well, writing is a creative act, and in some ways that's a magical operation as well. So I can see why people would need a ritual around it to focus their intention. Well, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I have one way and somebody has a, someone else and it works for them. I'm yeah. not, certainly not belittling them at all. Um, I, um, <laughs> we, we, somebody wanted us to post 
photographs of our writing space and everybody else has got like a very clean area and of course maybe their candles and their crystals and I, I I deliberately messed mine up. I had liquor bottles lying all over the floor. I had my dog sitting on top of my uh, uh, on top of my chair, and then my screen uh, on my on my computer was somewhat questionable material. If anybody wanted to take. <laughs> Now, see, that all reads to me very noir as well. Like, that's what I want from my noir detective writer, especially. <laughs> you know, I want to see maybe even some panties around a chair or something. <laughs> well, well, yeah. They weren't mine. I won't say. But, yes, yeah. it's awesome. This, But that's what I'm saying, though. This is important, especially in the arts. And it, it's so... I find as an artist in the world that it, I, I don't even like titles. I, so I don't like to say that, but it, people understand this is the clarity thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just find people have so many weird W Y R D by the way, weird, uh, weird conceptions of what, what you should be, how this looks and and it, it, it and not just the time like the idea of the writer but anything the idea of how the writer should be and when you, if you're not published by this point you should give up and all this it, it's just all this all these weird terrible stories around uh how one should be and how the process plays out and one of the things i'm obsessive about is listening to pardon me how others experience the muse you know which you've given us a really good a good idea and you know the muse's inspiration or you know i mean you can have you want to look at the muse and so but just the idea of the muse and for me it's definitely a a, a magical experience in that an idea just comes like a download and i'm like oh oh here we go and and then it just it comes forward and I don't do anything in specific to call the muse forward. Sometimes I'll pace, you know, sometimes I won't. Sometimes I wake up from a dream. Sometimes I don't, you know, it's just like it's things come to me and then I have to sit down and, uh, and entertain the muse. That's what I call it. Entertain the muse. And then it comes forward. So that's how, how I work. And so I'm always intrigued how other people work, just like how other people dream. It, I find these things are interchangeable. Active imagination, daydreaming, sleep dreaming, uh, going on the process of discovering stories. Was that a question? Yeah, I th that, that. <laughs> It's not a question. It's just okay. an interaction okay. with Mario. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I'm like, wait, um, it was so long. I'm like, wait, I got lost. No, no, no. I'm just interacting. <clears throat> I just wanted yeah. to say that the fact that you got published at 50 has inspired me to work on my novel, my first novel. So, Okay. Well, you know, okay. you have to Good in luck, yourself. Kid. Oh, you I do. Believe, you I've... believe in yourself. And, and uh, I. this is... Some some of the things that that when I when I talk to uh, students and um, that I, I, one of the things I tell them is to find your tribe, uh, your writing tribe, uh, and the, your writing tribe has to have a couple of attributes to it. One of it is uh, everybody in the tribe has to be serious about writing, uh, because you you'll have people show up like to keep to critique, and they'll never bring their own work, and they'll just they like to critique but they don't like to be critiqued. So that's, mm. you want to avoid that. You all want to avoid drama queens as well. Um, you want, so you want Go people ahead. that are pretty level. And then the other thing is that you want to write, uh, people understand your work and that you, you push each other along. And um, for example, if you're writing, if you're in a group like mine, we like, my group likes noir. <laughs> we like we like gritty. We like dark. Mm -hmm. uh, and if if you if you bring in work that's not that way, we kind of try to push you that way. 
you know, like we're like, oh, this is a nice story, but you know, what if they take a chainsaw <laughs> to somebody? Or, you know, what if they summon <laughs> demons, you know, at this point? That'll make the story more interesting. They go, well, no, it's a children's <laughs> book. <laughs> and they go, well, children got to be exposed to this sooner or later. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not new to write. I've, I've published 10 books. They're just all nonfiction. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's one of the things. It's, it's a different fiction is a different beast yeah. altogether. Yeah. Um, um, you know, in some ways it's easier. In some ways it's more difficult. For example, in, in nonfiction, if you put together a proposal in center of chapters, uh, you'll probably sooner or later get somebody interested, but that process doesn't work for a, a novel. You have to have the whole thing and you have to have somebody that right. it resonates with them. And, and, and a lot of it is timing. People come and they tell me, look, Mario, you got it the right time with the vampire and you timed, you know, you timed it right. And I'm like, I, I, I didn't even think about that. I just, I just had the book out and it would just happen. Somebody was looking for something different and there it was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it caught my eye. I mean, that's what I found Thank it. You. Thank you. I um, I was I wanted to ask if if you had had when you were in Iraq, Iraq, did you have anything supernatural happen? No. 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 Um, the only the only two supernatural things that have happened in my life are, are paranormal. Uh, yeah. Paranormal. Yeah. It, it, one uh, when I was around, let me think. Um, Uh, high school and it's between my sophomore and junior year uh it was summertime i'm, I'm walking down the street and it was a street in las cruces a straight it was alameda boulevard if you need to know and way 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 off in the distance i saw a person walking toward me and all i could see was it was a person that's all and i didn't like i couldn't tell if what gender the person was and who it was and and then this person uh, kept walking, was walking toward me. We were, we were approaching one another, and we met. And it was, uh, it was uh, her name was Kathy Kraus, and she was a student, a fellow student, and a uh, classmate. And we were, I mean, we were classmates. This is about it. Uh, um, knew each other's names and so. But she moved away uh, to Houston, and I had not seen her. So there's no reason that I would be thinking about Kathy Krause and here she was. And she looked at me and she goes, Mario, I knew it was you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm like, wow, it was like, how did this happen, right? She said, I, as soon as I saw you in the distance, I knew it was you. And then we kind of acknowledged that and then we just went our different ways and we never saw each other again. Um, so that was kind of a weird thing that stuck with me. And then the other one was, um, it, it, sometime in my senior year, I, you know, I really liked, was really into, you know, military stuff and, um, and, and the, the Thunderbirds, if you know who they are, the Air Force demonstration team. Yeah, yeah. They, they were going to be at Holloman Air Force Base. So I was really excited. So I, I drove, it was like, like an hour and a half. So I drove there and uh, the Air Force Base was open and they had displays everywhere. And they had this hangar where they had the, uh, at that time, the Thunderbirds flew this jet called the Phantom Jet, the F-4 Phantom. And they had a Phantom that belonged to one of the squadrons. It wasn't one of the flying, the demonstrations. It was one of the actual fighting planes. It was camouflage, you know, sitting in this uh, hangar. And it was, it was a spring day. And I, I'm, I walk in the hangar and all of a sudden I feel this blast of cold air. And I was started looking around. I thought, well, maybe I walked into an air conditioning duct or something, and, I'm, and I didn't see anything. And, and then I knew that sometimes those planes, when they when they uh, uh, energize the electronics, they build up a lot of heat and they hook them up to external air conditioners. And I didn't see anything like that. So, and then I stepped back, and then the the air is warm. And then I stepped forward, and the air is just like frigid cold around this airplane. And then I, I kind of step back and, and I'm looking and to see if anybody else has this reaction. And I, like, I'm the only one. And I'm thinking to myself, what is this all about? It's just, it's just stuck. So then later on um, that day, they had the actual demonstration and the, you know, it's a big choreography that they routine that they do is very impressive. But on takeoff, two of the Phantom Jets crashed. And um, 
Well, they, they smacked into each other and then one of them crashed and the pilot ejected. And, you know, so this is plane worth, I don't know how many, $20 million or something. It, you know, crashes and blows up and we watch this. And I, and I thought, wow, that, that intense cold feeling that I got was a premonition that something bad was gonna happen because I kind of made the connection in that it was an F-4 Phantom jet that was in the hangar that I felt this cold bubble around and then it was a Phantom jet that crashed. So that, that uh, uh, and, I, I, and no one will convince me that that did not happen and that, that that's not what was going on. Uh, but that's the, the last time I, I felt anything like that. And what I what my takeaway from that experience was that I actually thought that I would be warned in the future about premonition. I kind of felt I was protected, right? Which turned out not to be true. Um, but I just, I felt for a long time that, yeah, nothing bad is going to happen because I'm going to be warned about it. Um, so that was my my only two uh, paranormal or supernatural experiences that I've had. I, th I tend to think the same way that, that I'll be warned about things before they happen. And in hindsight, I usually find those clues that I missed at the time. No, mine, no, mine, <laughs> mine were like lightning in the middle of a clear day. Boom. <laughs> and um, I mean, you know, sometimes in retrospect, you'll, you'll kind of see clues but mm -hmm. it's it's really not like a premonition it's not like what i felt at that time yeah it's interesting did you ever read um was it uh beware the night by mm -hmm. ralph sarchi i think the guy's name was no 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 i haven't he was uh, an iraq war vet too and had an encounter with demons in iraq oh. wrote about it. i think that was the movie i can't remember now i'm mixing up the Ooh. book with the movie well well, yeah, my first book has that supernatural component in it. And, yeah, and and the, and in the, in, the, in that in the first book, the Nympho the Rocky Flax, the very first chapter, except for the vampire part, that actually happened. Mm. Um, and and uh, 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 I, I I I was in a kind of passing through a military hospital when all the the little girl came in and. Uh, and it was a real downer. I mean, but it, it kind of that writer, my writer brain kind of latched onto it, said, I, I'm going to use this at, at, at some point in the future. I'm going to find a way to channel all this horrific violence into a story uh, in, in a way that that is not uh, gratuitous to what actually happened, um, it, which which I think I think works. It totally works. Well, thanks. Well, and that's part of the the freedom of fic under the fiction title too. There can just be there's usually a lot of bio in there or memoir in people's fiction from their personal lives, and of course, this is what we draw experience from. Yeah. Uh, well, when when I wrote my my first book, it was just it was a, what we call a standalone. And then my my agent at the time he says uh, books like this sell better as a series. So I'm like, okay, I can go with that. And he goes, give me some titles. So I'm like, uh, so <laughs> my se my second two titles uh, were I didn't even have a book yet. I just had titles. So my second book was uh, X-rated Bloodsuckers, and then my third book was The Undead Kama Sutra. I and love these titles, Marty. So, I love them. But jailbait so zombie. I, and then you are jailbait zombie, and then uh, werewolf smackdown. Werewolf smackdown. Right? And then yeah. uh, rescue from planet pleasure. <laughs> I haven't I read that one so yet. Much. Okay. Well, it's, I, I I would, I mean, I would recommend kind of if if you sort of so you don't have to wait too long. I you know I like them all. Uh, they all have something to add, but the the. The first one obviously sets things up, but then if, if you really want to uh, see where I kind of dig more into a lot of the supernatural and the aliens, that would be in uh, uh, Rescue from Planet Pleasure. Um, and I, what happened is that um, when I was, I made a miscalculation when I was writing my books and that the, the every book is about character and, and you have to have, uh, the audience develop empathy 
not just empathy, but actually care about the characters. So in my first book, I had a romance between uh, uh, my vampire and a druid, a forest nymph. And people were asking me, hey, when are they going to get together again? And I, 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 I thought, well, no, that was it. The relationship is over for now. So I, I, I didn't get back to that till the fifth book. Um, and so every, every book was just my character going to a different uh, city, different locale, having a different adventure. And I didn't really have a, a broad arc that spanned uh, the books. It was just every book was sort of self-contained, but they, they do uh, uh, proceed consecutively and they kind of build up on that. And in my third book, my, my vampire, my female vampire femme fatale is kidnapped by the aliens. And I'm gonna kind of spoil the ending here for you, but uh, I, uh, it would make sense for my, my vampire Felix to rescue her. That's what you expect, right? But in the end, he doesn't, he fails. And she is taken from earth by the aliens. And I, and I kind of did that sort of like to throw a curveball to the, to, the, to the reader. But then I, I didn't think, how am I gonna bring her back? And I, I had no idea how my, I had no idea. She was off in space somewhere. So then I was writing my, uh, my fourth book, The Jailbait Zombie, and a fan, this guy named Stevan Lucero, who, who does this great paintings using uh, uh, Aztec and, and pre-Columbian uh, iconography in his paintings. He really, he was a fan and he, was, and he started talking to me about my books and he tells me, oh, it's so brilliant what you did. And I'm like, what are you talking about, right? I didn't understand. And, and of course I was going along with him like, yeah, yeah, it's brilliant, but I had no idea what he's talking about. And he goes, yeah, the way you're setting up, bringing Carmen back. And I was thinking, and he goes, yes, you're gonna use the psychic plane. And he started telling me how I oh, was wow. building it up in all the books <laughs> and I had not realized that is what I had done. So that's how they were able to find my, my vampire, Carmen, and bring her back, is they, they use a psychic portal. Um, and so I was able to bring a lot of that into it. And then, but it was really interesting how this guy was picking up all those clues that I had written and I had no idea I had put them in the book. <laughs> that's brilliant how that comes out. See, that's part of the muse magic, I call it. Right. Yeah. She's, yeah, she's definitely smarter than I was. Um, so, um, so, I, so, uh, being from New Mexico, you know, we had the, the, of course, the most famous UFO incident, uh, the, uh, the Roswell crash. So that's, th that was one thing I, I work into my stories. Um, and then we, I also referenced the, Soc the Socorro. There was a UFO incident there. Yes. And, and I, I, I bring those in, um, and in, in my world, uh, the way I have it set up is that the, the earth is under, well, it's, it's kind of very topical right now. The, the entire earth is under quarantine by the aliens because we humans are so dangerous that we get off the planet, we'll just, we'll just run amok and we'll just take over their technology and that. So, um, are so the, the reason that the aliens are, what happened in, in, uh, in uh, Roswell is the aliens have come to earth because I've thought about, you know, people talk about aliens being on a higher intellectual plane and things. And I was trying to, I've always been trying to figure out how that would actually work. You know, how, if people are, if, if the if, uh, beings are smarter than us, how would that manifest itself? And I'm thinking, well, there's a lot of aspects to uh, intelligence that, I don't think really manifest themselves in, in necessarily higher IQs. Um, and so I thought, well, what advantage would the aliens have on us? And, I, and, and in my story world, the aliens have sort of figured out a, a way into the psychic plane. And the way they try to control the, try to control the humans is they have this thing called a psychotronic projector. And I never really get into any specifics about how it actually works. I just, it just does. And that's what the UFO uh, in Roswell was doing. It was, they had broken the quarantine because they were trying to test the psychotronic projector on humans. And somebody made a mistake and crashed this, their UFO. And you know the rest is sort of folklore and history.
Are, are you aware that those two concepts are actually part of UFO lore today? What? <laughs> a quarantine around Earth and a psychotronic projector. Uh, well, I'm not surprised by that. Um, I'm going to say something here that um, when you were talking with uh, uh, Suzanne Ross, mm -hmm. you had been talking about the, the little aliens and things. And she actually mentioned something that kind of keyed off one of my thoughts, which is about the, the you know, the grays. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues I have with the grays is that, you know, they're small, they're naked. And she said that they maybe are actually not the aliens. They're actually uh, biological AIs. Yes. And that's what I was yes. thinking. That makes yes. more sense to me because I think the aliens would have read War of the Worlds. So they they're very much aware that we're this petri dish with all kinds of nasty stuff down here and they don't want to contaminate themselves i mean it, and so but they want to know, learn about us and i think these little creatures would make sense because one they're naked two if they get captured so what they're actually not the actual beings they're uh, biological robots I right guess. That, yeah that that's a big thing that a lot of people do believe that they are actually biological entities into which consciousness can be projected from their planet or wherever they live. Right, right, yeah. Because they can't come here. Okay, yeah, or maybe they're in the mothership. Uh, who, who knows? Um, there was um, one, one of, when I was starting to write my first book, uh, I was at the library and this, here's, this book popped right out. It's called Zero Point and I, I don't even, can remember who wrote it and it's a nonfiction and it has to do zero point has to do with the, the manipulating of gravity to the to to where you can actually uh, uh, modulate gravitational force basically a UFO engine is what he's talking about and then the book starts with this fantastic story of um, a true story where uh, General Patton had sent a, a force into Czechoslovakia. And in Czechoslovakia, the Nazis had built this, uh, it was a mountain they had hollowed out and they were, they were testing their, uh, their last ditch weapons there. And uh, the, the American army went there and in clear violation of the, of the, the treaty that they had with the, with the Russians because that was in the Russian territory, but the Americans find out that they had all this Nazi high tech. So they went over there and they rounded up a lot of these scientists and took a lot of their papers. And, and then they brought them here. And then uh, if you guys are familiar with Operation Paperclip. Of course. Right, well, oh, yeah. this, was, this was part of that. Well, in, in this book, one of the things that was taken was this device. Um, the Glocka? No, it's the, it's like a toroidal something or other. I, I should have written it down. But apparently the rush, apparently, according to this storyline, the, the, the Nazis had actually invented some kind of zero point device, but it resulted in oh, a catastrophe. The Hanabu. Well, the there, Hanabu, were, there were two. There was the Hanabu and there was the Glocka. The Glocka disappeared. Yeah, that one went somewhere. So, uh, so then, Cax so the Berg, first part of the book was really compelling to me. But then, in the second part, he's I, he kind of lost me on that. Uh, but he 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 at one point he actually uh, had reproductions of ads from prominent aviation uh, magazines, like there was an ad from General Electric, which pretty much said we are on the verge of an anti gravitational machine. Mm -hmm. And then within a couple of years, there was no talk about that. And uh, the author actually uh, met one of the guys who worked on that uh, project. And this guy was very tight lipped about it. He says, he said, I'm not going to deny anything that you're reading, but I said, I'm not <laughs> going to acknowledge anything either. And, uh, and the guy died with his secrets. Uh, so that, that was, you know, what, what actually happened, we don't know. But I, I did use that in my in my book, the zero point device. That's cool. Are you familiar with um, what the hell was it? The uh, the Sonaro Aero Club. 
Sonara Aero Club, and their airships like this. Oh my god, I can't remember the name of the group. No, no, it doesn't 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 sound familiar. Um, there were some some um, wealthy German elites or whatever that had. Is it the Sonora Aero Club? Sonora Aero Club, yes, and they had brought. This is like during the gold rush time in, in the West Coast. Had airships that flew around that were allegedly anti-gravitational. Which then, you know, ties into like T. Thompson Brown and his work. And Tesla had some anti-grav stuff. I, I do believe that technology exists. It's just not as profitable as fossil fuels are apparently. Right, right, that, and maybe it's very tricky. <laughs> you make one mistake and you're, you know. True, or maybe yeah. it's just not, it's not practical to use for mass transport. Yeah, I, 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 I don't, I don't know. You know, I love the TV show uh, Futurama because <laughs> they, they take, you know, they just take all these devices and then take them to their like logical extreme. Yep. And, and uh, like those tubes, everybody's shooting yes. and uh and then i love the tubes you know futurama is <laughs> like my favorite cartoon i have a bender tattoo on my back oh oh that's how we, twisted i am uh, we like the professor what's his name uh, Far farnsworth yeah good news everybody <laughs> <laughs> someday <laughs> we'll get billy west on the show that's my okay. that is my dream <laughs> Yeah, I, I that I, I like I like that show. Uh, I, I remember one that was when Fry came in and he was really he says he says I went to this place and I couldn't believe it. There's all these beautiful colors and music. It's undescribable. And I go, where was this? And he goes, well, it was downtown. Oh, that was the display outside the shoe store. <laughs> <laughs> it's so brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Where do you stand on um, phenomena like deja vu? Uh, well, this is what I understand of, of deja vu is that it's uh, it's caused by by like a, a a memory lag, like your your as you're processing things into your memory, that somehow that it gets disconnected. So it, you process it as a memory first before you process it as something that has actually happened. So that's why it makes it seem as if you've been there. So that's, that's how I read how, what, what deja vu works. Or I haven't had deja vu happen to me in a long time, but that's what, that's what I've heard how, how it works. So when when you've had it, though, is, is you know, because the, the thing about that is for me, when I've had it, I've almost always been able to track it back to dreams I've had at some point. And and everyone's given us I mean, there are just a lot of different definitions and explanations around stuff like this. And so for me, it was, oh, yeah, I I dreamt this at one point and then I'd have to go check my dream journals and, and, you know, find them or just remember that I had dreamt it. Uh, and so it kind of shoots that idea out of the water, at least for the way I experience a deja vu. Right. Well, I mean, on, on the, on the subject of dreams, I, my personal theory is that dreams are one of the big, uh, uh, motivators for the development of humanity because you know you have a dream and you wake up and you start wondering did this happen or did it not happen and even if it if you convince yourself that whatever you dreamt about didn't happen it makes you aware that there's more to the world than what is immediately tangible to you and it and it, and, and to me i would think that the the early people would it would, it would it would make them think, okay, what's on the other side of that hill, for example. Or if they would have dreams and they would uh, perceive them as some kind of a predictive uh, phenomenon, like the Bible has got several of those, right? So I think it very early on in human development that they realized that dreams were this, this portal into this world that exists outside of us. And that that is 
and, and, and that made people aware that there's more to the world that, than, than what is right immediately in front of us. Well, with the idea of portals and memory, which is also a portal uh, that takes us somewhere we thought was real, that we ascribe is real, but it's, it's murky, memory is murky. Uh, what, about, what about death? You know what? What do you? What do you think about all that? What's going on with death? Uh, well, I, 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 I definitely. If I don't believe, I want to believe in an afterlife. That's that's for sure. Um, and I, um, you know, I, I like I was in the Gulf War. We went to this battlefield, and there were like pieces of soldiers lying all over the place. And, um, you know, so you know, I, I, people talking about, you know, death is this transition, you know, for these guys, it wasn't a very pleasant transition. Um, and um, so in, in that regard, I mean, it was just this very cold experience uh, uh, for them. I, you know, and then I've had uh, uh, People that were close to me pass on, die, you know, and um, depending on the circumstances, you know, how it would affect me. Uh, and um, so, you know, I, I mean, I mean, obviously, death is, you know, is 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 part of life. Uh, but what exists beyond that, I don't, I don't know. Um, I th and I think maybe we're not supposed to know. <laughs> there was a, there was a movie that came out, and and I wish I would have I would have uh, kept the name memory of it. But in this movie, the premise was that they had scientifically proven that there was an afterlife. So so what happened is that, that all of a sudden people all over the world started committing suicide. It was that Redford movie? <clears throat> was Rob, that Redford movie? Robert Redford and Jason Segel, I think. Okay. It was uh, on I Netflix. Don't, don't, okay. What's you know the title of it? I'm looking it up. Okay. Um, it was like the, the believing or something like that. Okay. So, um, I mean, so, so maybe that, that's why we're not supposed to know, because if we did know, people would start checking out of this life right away um, and, and leaving, you know, other people behind. Is it so with the discovery? The discovery, okay. When you, so this imagery you saw in the Gulf War and all this, and then with uh, with those you've known close that, that have mm -hmm. passed on, mm -hmm. have, do, have you at all encountered any of them in the dreamscape? Well, now, I asked you already about your sister, but I didn't ask you about others. No. No. So none of them, you've had no encounters with these. When you got back from the Gulf War, did you have, uh, did you have dreams at all? Do you still, do you even know of, because that's pretty intense. My brother was in that war as well. Uh, it, it's pretty intense stuff. You know, wars, wars real and intense. And, uh, you know, I'm wondering, did any of it get worked out in your unconscious? just in a way that you got to experience imagery through the dreamscape? No, no. I mean, I mean not, not unconscious dreaming, daydreaming, but not, not, uh, not, a, not asleep, no. And when you say daydreaming, do you mean just like reliving or, do, you know, do these images pop up for you? out of nowhere like what what would bring on some of that stuff and i i know that you know there's a level of ptsd that goes on there's all kinds of levels to ptsd and um and all that and so like my brother for example never appeared to have any but i i know him, i knew him so well that you know i knew when he was having moments um no, I, 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 uh, I guess I got lucky, right? You know, I mean, um, um, 
we we got shot at one time, but it was over so quickly we didn't even know it mm -hmm. what was going on. Um, the only time I actually felt afraid, we had a uh, uh, we had to clear out some enemy bunkers, and um, we we kind of knew that they were des they were deserted, they were abandoned. But it, when we were walking toward them, we looked around, and all of a sudden we realized we were in the middle of a minefield. Ooh. And there were all kinds of ex explosives, uh, unexploded ordnance around us, rockets and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I, you know, when I saw those mines, I was like, holy crap, you know, I mean, I just, you know, I step on one of those things and you're dead or blows your leg off or something. And I was like, my heart was pounding my, you know, you read the stories where you, where the character says, I, I, I heard my pulse pounding in my ears. Mm -hmm. Well, that actually happened to me. I was just out of control, and not out of control, but it just like almost overwhelming. And we went in the bunkers, and there's all kinds of stuff, and we kind of catalog what we found. And 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 I was thinking, you know, if I get hurt, what was the point? All right, there was not even an enemy here; it was just a, some some bomb somebody left behind. Mm -hmm. um, so nobody actually got hurt. It was just, but it, because we were very very careful, and and there was a the crew chief for the helicopter, I made sure I stepped in his footprints. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would do. <laughs> That's a sure way, right? Yeah, that was that was a sure way. So as far as PTSD or anything, I, I didn't, um, you know, I I got lucky. There was, I you know, I, I ran into some people that, that, that weren't lucky. Um, I, I, years, years prior to that, I guess the only thing that was ever close so something like that is uh, we were flying and one of our helicopters uh, crashed and and there was a couple of I saw my buddies in the helicopter and they crashed and uh, uh, one of the guys and I'll tell you his name Dom Parker he was a, he was a great guy he was actually kind of a hard guy to get to know but uh, we we, I don't want to say we became best friend or probably even good friends, but he would invite me over. I'd invite him to my house, uh, you know, have, have dinner. And he invited me to his house, uh, his family. Um, and, you know, we talk and, and it was kind of a little bit of a rivalry in a sense, professional rivalry between us. But I really admired the guy. And then he got, he got killed in this helicopter crash. And I felt really guilty about it because it was one of those things, you know, survivor's guilt. That's what I felt. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, and it was a horrific spectacle. This helicopter fell to pieces and we just, it just, you know, it just kind of fell apart and it dived into the, dove into the ground and exploded. And, you know, that was it, him and the other guy there. I mean, there was no way they could survive that. And for about a year afterwards, I would kind of see him in a mirror. Like I would go and shave. And then right in the corner of the mirror, I would, I would sense that he was there. And then I would turn and he was gone. Mm. And, and so, um, so maybe it was my guilty conscience sort of believing, you know, or maybe it was him coming back. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? I wish it was, but, uh, but you felt it like it really was a presence, right? I mean, you absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, and then I had a, a something I had, a collection of my old cell phones and that of another friend of mine more recently who passed away. And, um, I was, I had, I got the, I got the phone and I, uh, and, and, and I was going through it. And all of a sudden I, 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 I found his old text messages. And when I first saw the first text message, the thought was he is contacting me from beyond. And then I realized <laughs> that no, it's a, text message from you know a couple years back yeah uh, but there was that first feeling oh my god you know and i you know that'd be a great story right getting text messages from somebody you thought was yeah absolutely mm -hmm. and very timely as well with the tech and all that around right yeah 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 it's it's interesting but you know there's that one that one experience you talk about and that's in the mirror with your friend that popped in and it felt like a, pre you know, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate how you, uh, how cautious you are with not going too deep into the woo of it. I appreciate that. I like this about your personality that we've been able to uncover tonight. 
uh, it it's lovely, especially coming from a fiction writer. But there, there it was. I mean, there've been a couple experiences that are, you know, right there in the woo, so to speak. Right, right. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to deny them. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not a, a woo writer. I consider myself a very nuts and bolts kind of a writer. Uh, but you know, I recognize that there's a lot of experiences that that I'm not privy to, and and if they motivate somebody, that and then they should, they should act on it. Um, and, you know, if somebody was to tell me that they're all, their stories came to them from dreams or that they went to some vortex, and if it worked for them, I'll say, wow, okay, great. I, I wish I could channel that energy, but it, mm -hmm. it, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, that's not what's working for me. Uh, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's, you know, sitting down and, and working, and it doesn't always come easy, <laughs> let me tell you, sometimes... It's it's like a uh, uh, you know taking pulling making blood come out of a stone uh, sometimes sometimes <laughs> it's 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 uh, it's a lot of work I mean sometimes and I think what I try to do is I try to think about what I'm gonna write ahead of time and and get my subconscious to work on that like uh, yes like even Hemingway in his book uh, what was it called uh, a movable feast mm -hmm. he, he actually talked about that uh, about uh, he, when he would write, he would stop writing in the middle of a sentence and pick it up the next day. And even if he didn't know what he was going to write next, he still hit a, he would let his subconscious work on that uh, overnight. And that's something that I try to do. Yeah, I'd, I approach all my art in that, in that way, actually, no matter what I'm working on. I, I sometimes think it's a really good idea to step away. And, um, and I don't, not everything, but some things where it's like, there just needs to be a breath. And for me, a breath is usually a night's sleep, you know, I'd get a day behind me and then I'll come back. Mm -hmm. And I, I tend to do well with that, that modality. So I'm wondering if we had any questions, Jer. I do I have two questions. So someone wanted to know what the Aran Arani I can't pronounce it. Ara Araneum? Arane Araneum. Araneum is based yeah. on the inspiration for that. <laughs> that's that's the muse talking to me. Uh, the Araneum is is Latin for spider web. And that's mm. the that's the that's my term for the vampire underworld. Right. Ooh. And they they're actually um, they they have to they have a mandate of keeping the supernatural hidden from you know regular humans, mm -hmm. and and my vampire over time actually becomes an enforcer for the Aranium, where they tell them hey there's another vampire that is threatening to spill the secrets make sure that doesn't happen, uh, so that's uh, so it's like an uh, undead triad or yakuza yeah the undead undead uh, what are they uh, what is it uh, Cosa Nostra. Yeah, Cosa Nostra thing. Yeah, the and mafia. Merta. Yeah. So that's interesting. And then someone wants to, or it was Ron? It was Ron wanted to know who you identify with most, Felix or Coyote? Oh, <laughs> who do I, I? I, you know what? I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna answer that because those guys would, those guys would come back in my dreams and get me. Because neither, neither one of them would say I'm good enough to be either one of them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Felix would say, you first of all, you're too short to be me. And uh, your hair, you're losing too much hair. And Coyote, or Coyote, he is he's way out there. He, he, would, he would totally tie me up in knots. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I got one more question. Um, do you have a writing routine? Do you write certain time of the day, set hours, words per day, et cetera? Uh, yes, I my my writing. I'm a morning person, so I my the heavy lifting for my brain is in the morning. So mm -hmm. um, I try to start writing like at eight thirty in the morning, and I try to go till noon, um, and I I try to get in about. It just depends. I mean, if it's like the very first rough draft, I'm having a hard time with it. I kind of force myself to do a thousand words. 
But if things are kind of chugging along at maybe 1,500 to 2,000 words, um, fresh words. And, and, and so I generally, when I have a project, I try to do a, like a, a chapter a week. So that would be, I don't know, 25, 3,000 words. But by that time, I've edited them several times. I've gone over it several times. Right. I let it sit. And then I work several projects at, at the same time, overlap. Um, so Great. Uh, Any yeah. more Felix Gomez books coming out, or are you done with that series? You know, um, I don't know. Okay. I really don't know. I mean, Good I thought answer. I was done. And then, and then, and then somebody come and poke me, and I had to write the uh, uh, steampunk banditos. <laughs> uh, that one. Um, well, remind me after the show to tell okay. you my idea. I've got an idea for your next book. Okay. Well, next. I actually have several ideas, but they're not not Felix Gomez books. Okay, I got a Felix Gomez villain for you if you want to do oh, another. Okay. Well, I got lots. Yeah, I got lots. Of <sighs> okay. Villains. Never mind. I'll write my own book. Damn it. Okay, yeah, right. <laughs> I know. I mean, if you're a writer, you'll have people come up to you and go, hey, I have this great idea for a book. I'll just dictate it. And you can write it and we'll split the proceeds. I don't know. I'm going to write it. I just thought you'd like the idea. Okay, sure. You can run it by me. Um, I, I, I guess uh, what's next? Um, I actually been running a lot of short stories, uh, more horror stories. So it's kind of stretching that way. I have a one idea that I've been kicking around and I've actually gotten several chapters of it is um, the orcs discover the Bible. Mm. And um, they think- <laughs> I love they, that. And they think the Bible is about them. <laughs> and, it, and it totally <laughs> screws up everything uh, because they think the orcs think they are the chosen people. And Interesting. Are, are these and, Tolkien orcs or D&D orcs? Uh, I like Tolkien ones. Okay, okay. And um, they they um, it, it they, they screw up hell, and then they get on Earth and and they kind of mess that up. Ooh, they're demons. <laughs> Every, yeah, well, well, they everything is demons. <laughs> they don't they don't they don't think they're demons. They think they're the chosen people. Um, All demons yeah, do. I like that perspective. Yeah, right. It just flips the table. Yeah, it's yeah, great. It flips the table. Yeah, I hate that. So, That's great. Um, so if you see me in a year, you can you're more than welcome to poke me if I don't have that book written. Where will you be in a year? Like maybe at a conference, I'll see you. That'd be great. Well, yeah. Well, actually, I was supposed to be in Emer in Seattle for Emerald City Comic Con, and that got so everything has pretty much been uh, canceled. Canceled. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe Salt Lake City. That's in September, uh, but that's still we'll still see. If, I mean, that's the only one that, that seems viable. Uh, I had a bunch of conferences I was supposed to go to this year. Um, but like I said, may, maybe next year. You should try and come to Atlanta for Dragon Con one year. I, I was in Dragon Con several years ago. Um, the, um, yeah, so yeah, it, it, that's on me. That's on me. You're right. That's no, me. it's not. I mean, I wasn't bitching. I'm saying it was just an idea. Right. No. Yeah. It comes, I mean, if the thing is that the logistics for it get pretty involved, and and if you're not in early, you can't get a hotel room, or you get a hotel room right out in the sticks, and then it becomes kind of counterproductive because you you know you just can't get around. I got extra bedrooms, dude. Okay. <laughs> you're always welcome. I'll drive you. Dragon Con's a good time. I yes. Yes. I had a great time when I was there. Yeah. The, the cosplay alone is just amazing. Right. Well, I've been to uh, uh, San Diego Comic Con. was was pretty. Cool. Yeah. Uh, but but you'd be surprised. Like we were in, in Raleigh, uh, uh, North Carolina. Their their science fiction con, and yeah, everywhere you go, people really mm -hmm. get into cosplay. Some really inventive stuff too. Yeah, it's great. I think Raleigh hosted the so, no, it was Charlotte, the Flat Earth Conference last year. Oh. You missed that. I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. It was there. I mean, it is a real thing. I, <laughs> I wanted to go. I really did want to go, but it was of course it was sold out. Well, yeah, I want to watch Freak, so I like them. Oh wow, it was sold out too. That's oh, yeah. awesome. Uh, anyway, this has been a fantastic conversation with you, Mario. Did you have anything you wanted to plug that's coming up? But you know, well, um, I have two anthologies, uh, both from Hex Publishers. 
One is called Psy War, which is about um, uh, the use of uh, psychic abilities in warfare. And I've got a short story there about Atlantis, no less. Mm. So, um, I, and then, uh, and then uh, later Ooh. on, we've got it came from the multiplex, which is horror stories set in '80s movie theaters. Oh, I love that. Uh, so I got, a, I got, a, I got, a, I got a story there about a serial killer uh, in that book. And then in October, scheduled right now, I have my Western novel, Luther, Wyoming, that's scheduled uh, from uh, uh, Five Star Press. That will, that's that's due out and so we'll see what happens in 2021 yes sounds like you're busy anyway i mean you're yeah you're cranking it right yeah and then my freelance stuff as well that takes up a lot of mental bandwidth <laughs> let me tell you <laughs> I, I, I believe it well thank you so much we've uh had a, it's been a pleasure talking to you tonight Oh no, my you know it was it was a, a big let's talk about me. <laughs> who's gonna who's gonna who's gonna say no to that? Oh, let's talk about me for two hours. No, uh, what? This was a lovely portrait. I really really enjoyed uh, diving into you, Mario. This was I, I can't wait. Like I said, to binge your books. I'm a, I'm an avid reader, so I'm gonna chew on those. And you brought in a lot of uh, wonderful insight into the writing process yes. and and definitely gave us an idea of who you are who the writer is behind these books thank you no it's my pleasure and thank you very much i'm, I'm flattered that, that you invited me here this is i mean i'm in good company i'd like to thank thank you yes. we're, we're just as flattered to have you yes oh, indeed i am at least <laughs> <clears throat> anyway thank you everyone for listening we appreciate it um Tune in next week. We've got an obelisk with Craig Williams is coming back to talk about his stuff, all the Vedic stuff. That should be really interesting. That's about all I got. Yes. Thank you. This was, I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to every week. This is my favorite night of the week. So <laughs> uh, thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Mario. Thank yeah, you thanks. for everyone listening tonight and into the future. And we'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.